All right, folks, roll up your sleeves. Here we go. We are going to talk about the formal memory model of OpenMP. All right, so for those of you who are with me and haven't run away screaming, here we go. Memory models. Memory models are interesting. <laughs> they describe the detailed rules for the consistency of the data as seen by each threads as they move forward in time. Most programmers should never, ever, ever think about the memory model. They should just stick to what we've covered so far. But advanced OpenMP programmers, ad advanced multi-threaded programmers, all right? Uh, if you're going to really start doing advanced programming where you're going to be doing fine-tuned optimization of how threads interact over shared data, you got to understand this stuff. And, and so therefore, we're going to go through it right now. Uh, hang with me. And if you want to think about what happens on a shared memory computer, this picture does a good job of representing it. It should look familiar because it's not too different than what we've talked about earlier. You've got to block a shared memory and you've got a collection of processing elements. And each processing element has its own cache. Now here's the problem. Think of a single variable, A. I don't call whatever you want. That variable sitting there, say it's a memory address, so it's got some DRAM location of values sitting there. But one processor, say processor number three, uh, has a, a value of that variable sitting in its cache. So now you can see in one shared memory machine, I have potentially two entirely different values of the variable A. And so now the question is, if processor 1 goes to ask what's the value of A, which will it see? Will it see the one in the cache of processor 3? Or will it see the one that's out in DRAM? Well, how do you know which one it will see? How do you control that? If you're going to write a well-behaved program, you have to know how it will decide which value to see. This gets a little bit hairy. Now, I'm about to make it even worse, and here we go. To understand this, you need to think about what a compiler does to your code as it compiles it. All right, so you hand your beautiful, elegant program that you've slaved over and you're very, very proud of, and you frame so you can hand it to your mom to look at, and, and it's just it, you're very happy about it. And the source code gives you a whole bunch of you know, reads, writes, operations. But all really we care about is the state that lasts as it moves on. So we really all we need to track is the reads and the writes. So I have in the notation on this picture, I'm going to have writes with a W and reads with an R, and the subscript is the variable name. So my source code has an order. I write a variable, then I write the next variable, then I read the variable, then I read the variable. So we can talk about what's the orders of reads and writes as seen in the source code. Now your compiler is going to take that and it's going to reorder it all over the place. Now I want you to, to, to bear with me for a moment because the first thing you might say is why would anyone be dumb enough to allow a compiler to reorder my code? I put it in a certain order, it should leave it in that order. But actually, Compilers are very, very good at looking at loads and stores, at reads and writes, and moving them around to optimize performance. Little things, like if it sees you're doing a scattering of reads, it may say, hey, wait a minute, if I do all these at once and, and do them uh, ahead of when I need them, I can prefetch. I can have them there in the cache ready for you when you're, when, when you're ready to compute on it. So I can do prefetching if I move them up. Oh, oh, right. Okay, I have a scattering of writes. What if I move them together and now they all sit in one cache line and it all goes out as one clean cache line moving off into memory? It turns out that compilers, while they're terrible at automatically parallelizing your program, they are really, really good at optimizing the orders of reads and writes. So we actually want them to have tremendous freedom in reordering reads and writes. So the compiler will do that, it will reorder it, and what you end up with is what's called the code order, all right? So maybe I'll have the write of B right before the read of B, and then the write of A right before the read of A. So I may swap those orders around, all right? And now it's going to give me the executable code that's going to run. Now I run that on the machine, and depending on what's happening on the machine, 
And, you know, I may be swapping threads in and out. You know, I may halfway through the thread computing, I swap in a thread to, I don't know, manage, manage an email message coming in. Who knows what? But the fact is, your operating system is swapping threads in and out. So the order that your compiler has put reads and writes may actually be quite different than what executes. What executes be, could be something quite different because of the way orders, because of the way threads are scheduled. So I have the source order, the program order, I have the compiled order, which is the code order, or I may have the execution order. And so as I go along, I may see variables sitting in memory or in threads, and they may be different depending on whether they're the cache of the processor or in the DRAM, and I may see even in a different order. So when I talk about memory consistency rules, I'm not just talking about what do I grab out of DRAM versus I grab out of cache. It's even worse than that. So this is what the memory model does, is it gives you the precise rules and the controls you need to control those orders when you have to. Not for the squeamish, trust me. So we think about the reordering that can occur, and what we're talking about is orders of reads, writes, and synchronization operations. So. R's, W's, and S's. And so we can talk about ordering reads relative to reads, ordering writes relative to writes, ordering reads relative to writes, ordering reads relative to synchronization operations, ordering synchronization operations with respect to synchronization operations, and ordering writes with respect to synchronization operations. So what the memory model does is it tells you where is the compiler allowed to relax those sorts of orders and where must it honor them. It sounds confusing, it is, trust me. So, sequential consistency. Oh boy, it would, yeah, it gets really complicated. If, in fact, if I was giving a lecture to an advanced uh, operating systems course in computer science, we'd spend a whole lecture on sequential consistency. So let me summarize it and try and put it very simple. Sequential consistency is what you probably think happens in your head already. Sequential consistency basically says is look, Reads, writes, and synchronization orders, they are in the order I put them in my dumb program, right? I wrote, I wrote them in my program, that's the only order I will observe. And the compiler can move things around, but I better not be able to observe any different order. And not only that, all of the threads should see the same total order if I have sequential consistency. All right, so my program said, the reads, the writes, and the synchronization operations are in this order, and all the threads will see that order, and it will be the same as my program order. Really easy for you to reason about. So sequential consistency is probably what, before you started hearing me talking about memory models, was probably what you expected would occur anyway. And it kind of makes sense. It's easy to reason about. Problem. If the program order equals code order versus equals commit order, the order it actually executes, I have lost so many opportunities for performance. I have put so many constraints on how memory can move through the subsystem that my performance is terrible. Sequential consistency on a shared memory machine, even though it's easiest for the programmer to reason about, leads to disastrous performance. So virtually every realistic system I know of for supporting shared memory machines relaxes sequential consistency. And what happens with relaxed consistency is you start to back off some of the strict orders on the reads, writes, and synchronizations. And so OpenMP supports a relaxed consistency model. All right? It basically says that you can move away from program order. We have a weak consistency. You can move around the reads and writes as seen by different threads. You can't change the reads and writes when it's going to change the answer for a single thread, but see if you have multiple threads, they're going to see whatever order of them is going to be there anyway. So good luck. But what it does say is that you can't move things around a synchronization operation. So what you as the advanced OpenMP programmer has to do is you have to appreciate that reads and writes as seen by different threads will be in all sorts of helter-skelter orders. But you have to put synchronization constructs because it has to honor the synchronization orders seen by all the threads. So you have to know which synchronization constructs to put in, where to put them, to force the orders to be consistent across threads when you depend on them to be consistent. Hopefully I've scared you.
Hopefully I've convinced you that you probably want to stick to barriers and critical sections <laughs> because there, yeah, it's high level. I can get away with just, you know, ignoring a lot of these details. But an advanced programmer going for ultimate performance sometimes wants to do things trickier than what I can do with a barrier or a critical section. And that's where you run into this stuff. Now the synchronization operation in question that we have to think about for this is called a flush. Let me tell you about the OpenMP flush. Flush defines a sequence point, which is compiler talk for think of a point in your program that is visible to you. So you have a sequence point in your program. And what it says is, is at this point you are guaranteed to see a consistent view of memory for the flush set. What's the flush set? Oh, good question. I think I'll tell you. The flush set is a collection of variables if my flush argument has a parentheses and a list. So I can say, the flush set consists of these few variables. Make my view of these few variables consistent. So that's flush with a list. Or I can leave off the parentheses in the list, and when that happens, I'm saying, hey, I want you to make the view of every th single thread visible variable consistent at this point. So if I have something sitting in a register, write it through to DRAM. If I have something sitting through in someone else's cache, Resolve that cache and write it through to DRAM. Flush can be kind of expensive. But what it guarantees, when I put a flush in my program, it says all reads and writes before the flush must resolve the memory. Before anything, any reads or writes that follow the flush can occur. All right? That's basically what it says. Now, what it also says is I can't reorder reads and writes around the flush if they involve the flush set. Remember what I told you, compilers are very, very good at reordering reads and writes to optimize a program. They're not allowed, though, to re reorder reads and writes around the flush set. So that's good. This is the other thing I can depend on. All right? And flushes with overlapping flush sets cannot be reordered with respect to each other. So these are the rules of the relaxed consistency model in OpenMP. Let me show you an example because I've, I've talked at you way too long to get to, to, and, and you need to see an example. Okay, so imagine I have an array A, and let's just say it's shared. Because if it wasn't shared, none of this would make any sense, right? You know, it only matters if it's shared. All right, I'm going to do a whole bunch of computing on this array A, uh, on this value A. All right, now I want to make sure that my value of A that I see, that thread who did that computation, is going to be shared for everyone else. It's going to be available for them to see. Then I would do flush of A. That's flush with a list. All right? Now, just for those of you who are hardcore computer scientists, you're probably going, why, that sounds like a fence. All right? And let me just tell you that for all intents and purposes, flush is equivalent to fence. Why we didn't call it fence, I don't even remember. It was too long ago. I'm too old to remember that far back. All right, so getting flushes at the right points in your program can be very challenging. And frankly, it's beyond, it's beyond the ability of most programmers to ever get right. Fortunately, we, in our benevolent goodness, caring for our programmers, have gone to great lengths to define implicit flushes in OpenMP. So most programmers never, ever, ever need to use a flush. And our first piece of advice is don't even use flushes explicitly unless you really know what you're doing. Anytime you enter or exit a parallel region, we do a flush. Okay? And that's a total flush. It's not a flush with a list. That's a total flush. So basically, when you enter a parallel region or exit a parallel region, we say, Everything's going to be resolved all the way back to DRAM. So anyone will see this thread's most recent value. All right? Now, at any barrier, whether it's implicit or explicit, we do a flush. So think about that. At the end of any work share construct, anywhere you put an explicit barrier, anywhere a barrier is implied in OpenMP, we're going to do a flush. So we're going to say that, and, and I can't stress enough, flush says, me the thread, me, the thread, doing the flush, my view will be made available to everyone else. It's not a global synchronization operation. It doesn't make anyone else's view consistent to anyone else. It says my view is consistent to everyone else. Okay? On entry and exit to a critical section, it's going to do a flush. 
And finally, it's going to do a flush whenever a lock is set or unset. So these are places where we went through as experts in memory models. <laughs> um, and we figured out where do you need to imply a flush to make this safe, and we put it in there. But flushes are tricky. And let me give you a good piece of advice. Remember when I said that the flush, there is a flush set that's defined, and a compiler is restricted on what it can move past a flush set. When I put a list on a flush set, so I'm saying, eh, just flush this variable, don't flush everything. Because, you know, it's really expensive taking everything in my registers and writing them through the DRAM and flushing all my cache lines, and oh my god, that's, that's horribly expensive. So I'm going to be really clever because I'm brilliant, and I'm just going to put just, you know, just the one thing I want flushed. Well, a compiler, if it looks at a flush and says, oh, that flush set doesn't overlap with these variables, I can move them past. Well, now I've just changed the ordering assumptions I might have thought I had in place. So be very, very careful because a compiler can reorganize instructions around a flush set if it doesn't overlap with that flush set. So I just want to tell you, don't use the flush with a list. <laughs> it's really hard to get things right when you use a flush with a list. Now, I'm going to show you an example later on where I do it. But be very, very careful when you use a flush with a list. Most of us who work with flushes, we just use the flush without a list. We just say, look, we're going to pay the hit of flushing everything. I've got an exercise for you, and this will be fun. So we have in the set of uh, programs for you to work with in going through these lectures, we have something called prod cons. It's prod cons. It's, it stands for producer consumer. And what basically is, is you're going to have one function produce a value and another function is going to consume a value. This is a very, very common pattern in parallel computing. It's actually a common pattern in concurrent algorithms. It's called the producer-consumer pattern, and it's just exactly as I said. You produce something somewhere, you consume it elsewhere, and so it requires, it requires pairwise synchronization. So the producer can tell the consumer, hey, I'm ready for you to do your thing now. And the consumer can say, oh, all right, I'll do it now. So that you, you need to have a direct pairwise interaction between the producer and the consumer. Now, you can't do that with just simple locks. You can't do that with a critical region. You're going to have to set that up and build your own spin locks and build your own locks and manage them with a flush. Good luck. We'll talk about it in a little while. Thank you.